Now look at part one. Part one. One. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a client. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Are you open yet? Yes, we are. Come in. Would you like to rent an apartment in the city? Well, kind of. I'd rather rent one near the harbor if possible. Oh, okay. Do you like the water? Yes, I do. But I actually repair sailboats for a living, so I'd like to be close to work. That's understandable. We all want to live close to work. Well, I think I have something near there. How many rooms would you like? Just one. I'm alone, but I would like to have an extra room for my dog. So you'd like two rooms and an apartment that accepts animals. Hmm. Here's one. It's one block up from the harbor and renting for four hundred and forty-five dollars. How's that? That's perfect. Just what I was hoping to pay. What floor is it on? Floor? Oh, it's on the twelfth floor. That's too high. I'd like to be on the first or second floor so that I don't have to use the elevator. My dog—he's scared of them. Oh well, then that's a little more complicated. Let me make a few calls. Okay, I think I found a couple more for you. Here's one that might suit your needs. How much? Three hundred and ninety-five dollars a month. That's cheap. But it's only a one bedroom, a large one, but it's still just one room. Oh, well, regardless of whether the room is small, I still need a separate room for my dog. What else do you have? Then I have a two bedroom for five hundred and sixty-five dollars on the second floor that is a little further away from the harbor. How far? About a half mile, and they accept pets. That's a little more than I had planned on paying. But I guess I could look at it. What's the address? Two twenty-four Williams Avenue, Harbor Square. Two twenty-four Williams Avenue. Got it. Now look at questions seven to ten. As the talk continues, answer questions seven to ten. What else is included? Let's see. It has a washer and dryer, refrigerator and stove, a bed, dressers and shelves, and access to a swimming pool, game room, and gym. Ooh, I'll definitely take a look. Hi, how did you like it? It's great. I love the amenities, but the bed and furniture are. Awfully dirty. Can they replace those before I move in? Sure, that shouldn't be a problem. Anything else? Yeah, I didn't see anywhere to park my car. Is there a parking lot in the basement? Yes, there is. Would you like to rent a space? No, I'd like that to be included in the rent. Oh well, I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee that. Do you want to take it anyhow? If those two issues were solved, I would love to take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk on cultural shock. First, 
You have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hi, congratulations on finishing orientation for our study abroad programme. Before you all head off to your respective countries, however, I want to first share with you a little bit about dealing with culture shock. Recent studies in intercultural experience have shown that there are distinct phases of adjustment which virtually everyone who lives abroad goes through. You won't be the exception. The first phase of culture shock includes gaining an awareness of the host culture, preparing for the journey and farewell activities. You're all experiencing this right now. The second phase begins when you arrive in your new country and ends when the excitement of the early experiences wear off. When you first get there, you will be overwhelmed. Initial impressions convey a sense of monumentality of the experience. You'll love it. During the third phase, you will start taking a more active role in your setting. This will produce frustration because there will be some difficulty in coping with even the most elementary aspects of everyday life. I remember not being able to find a toilet one day because I forgot the word for bathroom. Anyhow, your focus will shift during this phase to the differences between your new host culture and your home cultures. This can be troubling, but these sometimes insignificant difficulties can be blown into major catastrophes. That's why the stage is most often referred to as culture shock. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. But relax, when this stage is over, you will slip into the gradual adjustment stage. You may not even be aware that this is happening. You will just begin to orient yourself and to interpret subtle cultural clues. The culture will become familiar to you and you'll start to feel at home. The next phase will be your discovery that you have the ability to function in two cultures with full confidence, and you may even feel completely integrated into your new host culture. In this phase, you will also start to have a sense of shared fate concerning events abroad. The last stage is the re-entry phase when you return home. This can be for some the most painful phase of all. You will be excited about sharing your experiences, but you will realise that you have changed and won't be able to explain how or why. One set of values has already been instilled in you. Another you will have acquired in your host country. Both may seem equally valid. It is important that you realise that all of these phases are a natural part of adapting to a new culture. Expect peaks and valleys during your stay and feel free to discuss your feelings with the resident director. These culture shock phases tend to occur even with relatively short stays abroad. During your stay, if you feel a wave of bewilderment wash over you, remember this little talk and look back at your notes. One very typical reaction against culture shock is the tendency to hang out with other Americans. Remember, you are coming to a foreign country to get to know her people, language and culture better. If you avoid contacts with the foreign language, you cheat yourself and lengthen the process of adaptation. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3 you will hear a conversation about shopping. Masahiro is an international student who has just arrived from Japan. 
and Anna and Will are doing some shopping with him. You have some time to read questions twenty-one to twenty-six first. Listen to the first part of the conversation now and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Here we are, guys. I'm going to stop by Bergner's first. I might just get lucky today. Who knows? Some of their dresses might be on sale. Bergner's. It's a fairly well-known department store, sort of like Penny's. They've got some quality stuff. Do you want to check it out? Why not? I need to get something for Lisa's birthday. She's into name brands. Any suggestions? A Gucci handbag or a Calvin Klein T-shirt might be nice. Designer perfume is another option. Which reminds me, I have a fifteen percent discount coupon for Learners and Pennies. I hardly ever shop at Learners. I'm not that big on women's clothing. I rarely shop at Pennies. So go ahead and use the coupon if you can. Here they are. Thanks a lot, Will. That's really very thoughtful of you. My pleasure, ma'am. Oh no! I was supposed to give Liz a buzz an hour ago. Hope I have a quarter. Need a nickel? Actually, I don't have anything but pennies in change. Does any of you have a dollar in change? Sorry, I don't. But I do have thirty-five cents on me. Will that be okay for the phone call? Great. I really appreciate it. I'll make it quick. Do you guys want to go ahead? Well, wait. Just don't forget us. I won't. Why don't we just meet here in thirty minutes? Sounds good. I guess I'll just look around. Can I help you, sir? No, thanks. I'm just looking. Well, just out of curiosity, how much is that necklace? Twenty-nine ninety-nine. Really? My sister's birthday is tomorrow. She loves jewellery. I just wasn't sure I could afford it. You'll find that a lot of our stuff is amazingly affordable. Well, that's certainly nice to know. I'll take it. It's a good choice. I'm sure she'll love it. Let's hope so. Cash or charge, sir?、Uh, charge, please. Do you accept Discoverer? Yes, we do. Great. That comes to thirty-one ninety-nine with tax. Please sign next to X. Do you need some help, sir? Well, I'm looking for. Let's see. I've forgotten the name again. It's used to make fresh coffee. A coffee maker. That's right. Well, we have a few in kitchenware, which is upstairs. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, there you are, Masha Hero. What did you get? Just a simple coffee maker. Good choice. And you will find anything interesting? A necklace for Stephanie's birthday. Lucky her. Did you get anything? Just a couple of silly earrings that I liked. I did a lot of window shopping. That can't hurt. True. Well, do you guys need anything else from this place? One last thing. Oh no, I've forgotten what you call it. Just describe it, and we'll probably figure out what it's called. It's a crystal container for flowers with long stems. I need to get one for my mum. Oh, a vase. That's it. They should have a bunch in giftware. Let's go to get one. I'm going to have to stop by Jewel on my way home. Is that okay with you guys? I'm almost completely out of groceries. No problems. I could pick up a couple of things too. Look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now you will hear the rest of the conversation. As you listen, answer questions number twenty-seven to thirty. Hi, Masha Hero. How's it going? Fine, I guess. How about you? Busy. Guess who's coming our way? Hi, guys. What's up? Nothing much. We just ran into each other. That's nice. So, Masha Hero, how's the coffee maker working? Actually, it doesn't work well. It was a waste of money. I guess I should have shopped around for a good one. Why don't you take it back? I'd like to, but I've misplaced the receipt. Well, if it's any consolation, my shopping wasn't all that great either. I wish I'd never bought Stephanie a necklace. 
Just last night, she was telling me how she wished she had Liz Taylor's new perfume. She did not like my gift at all. That makes three displeased shoppers. Guess what? The camera I bought and shipped to Mike just this morning is now on sale. It's a pity that I bought it then. Then again, I guess I shouldn't complain. It was a good buy, even though I didn't get the best deal on it. Anyway, Mashahiro, I suggest you look for that receipt and just go to the complaints department and say, I'd like to exchange this, please. It's as simple as that. And Will, it's not too late for you to ask for a refund. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. Part 4. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean, to give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken. As you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide, you can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans in that it is landlocked to the north and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole. Covering some 73,440,000 square kilometres, the ocean constitutes approximately one-seventh of the Earth's surface and about 20% of the world's total ocean area. At the equator, it is around 6,400 kilometres wide, with the average depth being about 3,400 metres, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at 7,450 metres. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers. The Zambezi here, the Ganges here, the Indus, the Brahmaputra and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands and Mauritius and Réunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world, are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the Southern Ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. 
An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean. In the warmer north, islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship that we have stationed off Antarctica in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection, which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer.